Tuesday, April 2nd, 2019, Monaco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. This morning, I want to talk about the bank that financed World War II for both sides, for the uh, Allied uh, powers and the Axis power. And believe it or not, this bank is still around and it's actually uh, the bank for all the major central banks in the world. It also uh, is the major regulator for uh, the uh, major uh, too big to fail banks of the world. It's the bank that's uh, implementing uh, Basel III uh, rules for the last few years and is going to keep implementing implementing it. And it's called the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland. Um, and I highly recommend this book, The Tower of Basel. And I'll go through the passages in the book where it uh, clearly uh, shows that it financed both sides of the war. Um, you'd think this bank would have been buried, but it hasn't. And I'll come back to that in a minute when I start talking about it. I also uh, look at an interesting um, article in uh, the latest Economist. Uh, and it's about inversions and aversions, the world economy, where they're talking about the bond markets, you know, that we've been talking about so much, the inverted yield curve. And uh, they say something quite interesting that just shows the mindset of the bankers and uh, the monetary system. Before that, of course, I'll look into uh, what the markets are doing this morning. It's 7.34 a.m. London. Uh, yesterday was just quickly uh, about yesterday in the markets we had quite a few uh, numbers the we had retail sales out in the US that was uh, down 0.4 uh, the uh, core retail sales is expected up 0.4 retail control sales uh, was down 0.2 expected 0.4 Retail sales headline was down 0.2, expected 0.3. So very weak numbers there. But then we got some uh, of the PMI numbers. These purchasing managers numbers or NISM numbers, they're only surveys. You see, they're not real numbers. They're a survey of people working in manufacturing. Well, these were kind of mixed. Uh, the uh, manufacturing PMI came out at 52.4, was expected 52.5, so pretty much in line. But uh, the ISM uh, manufacturing PMI, which is different than just the manufacturing PMI, ISM, came out at 55.3, was expected 54.5. Uh, and the market just uh, went crazy after these numbers. And the uh, oil price went up 2%. Uh, I remember years ago when uh, if the oil market uh, went up a lot, we would see uh, stocks get hurt because it was uh, a signal that uh, things were going to get more expensive and that the consumer wasn't going to have uh, as much uh, disposable income to consume and to drive the economy forward. But nowadays, they... They talk at it, you know, they, they look at a, a higher oil price. It's the only thing they've got to pump up the stock market. That, that's the reason they give. Energy stocks are doing well. Uh, and we also saw yesterday that gold was doing well early on, got up to almost, well, I think it was 1297. And then as oil and the stock market kept ballooning, uh, we saw gold getting hit further and further. But uh, Let's see what's going on this morning right now. Well, we've got uh, spot gold at 1288.50. Range has been 1285 to 1290. Silver 1508, down about three cents. Uh, the uh, range has been 1515 to 1503. Uh, so, uh, what do I think of uh, the stock market? Well, is it just going, um, you know, they're trying to find more and more reasons. They jumped on the bandwagon about the Chinese PMI yesterday as well. Well, this morning, the markets are fairly quiet. The Dow is down 30 points, 26,221. Uh, S&P is at 28.62, down four points. NASDAQ 100 is down 10 uh, at uh, 74.64. Uh, the pound is at 130.53. It's down about a third of a percent. 
uh, the Brexit uh, chaos continues. Uh, they had more votes yesterday in Parliament for all kinds of stuff, and all of them failed. So I, I can't say what's going to happen. Uh, I think some people are talking that uh, the chance of uh, exiting the EU with a no deal, uh, that chance is growing. So just keep that in mind. Uh, the euro is uh, down 10 basis, well, 10 pips at 112.02. And the dollar, I noticed the dollar rallied quite, quite a bit yesterday against the yen. Uh, right now, it's unchanged overnight, 111.30, and the dollar is up uh, slightly against the yuan, 672.15. Uh, the the bond, bond yields rallied yesterday. Uh, I think uh, there was more optimism about things. You know, last week we're talking, you know, the markets are going low, we're going to have recession and stuff. But the, so the bond yields yesterday actually... Uh, the ten-year yield all, almost went back up, went back up to around two fifty. Uh, but this morning we are down two at two forty-seven. The three-month is at two forty-four. So the curve has disinverted. I, I think that's what uh, probably the powers that be, you know, the managers of the market, central banks, governments, uh, BIS. You know, the BIS actually a few years ago. Uh, there was a circular, and you can probably Google and find it, the CBOT, Chicago Board of Trade, and CME, uh, they're all together now. They actually uh, published a, a circular saying they're giving, uh, you know, a volume discounts for uh, international uh, uh, banking institutions, you know, central banks and the BIS. So the BIS has an account through probably JP Morgan, I would say, uh, with... Uh, the futures exchanges. So they're in there as well, probably doing a lot of gold futures and other things. So uh, that's the uh, bond market. So uh, let's go to the uh, Economist uh, magazine um, article before I go into the BIS. Uh, so they're talking here, uh, inversions and aversions. Uh, bond markets are sounding warning warnings on both sides of the Atlantic, but the message is much worse in Europe. And I thought, yeah, you know, but, and then they, they tell you why it's much worse in Europe here. Um, and I'll read. And he, uh, try to see if you think it's, is it, is it actually much worse or is it better? And it says that the fate of the Eurozone should depend on Beijing and Washington is a dereliction, dereliction of duty. Well, they're saying that uh, the European EU uh, economy, if China's doing well, EU will do well, and if the US is doing well. And it says as well, it is an economic superpower with its own fiscal and monetary levers. It should be countered, it should be countering downturns itself. Well, that's Keynesian, isn't it? Countering downturns. More unconventional monetary stimulus will be hard thanks to Northern Europe's horror of appearing to create money to finance deficits. But the Eurozone has no, <clears throat> and it says, but the Eurozone has room for fiscal stimulus. Its aggregate budget deficit was just 0.6 of GDP in 2018, while the US is running like a 5% deficit, right? Its net public debt was 69% of GDP, while the U.S. is running over 100% of GDP, uh, you know, debt. Um, and it goes on to say, because Europe lacks a centralized fiscal policy itself, a failure of politicians, the onus is on individual countries. Those with healthy finances, such as Germany and the Netherlands, could enact coordinated budgetary loosening. So... And then I thought after reading that, how can it be bad that actually the Eurozone is keeping a tight fiscal, uh, how can I say, situation? You know, uh, you'd think that would be good in the, in the normal world. In our world, uh, the less that we have, the, the less we spend over uh, what we bring in, the better. And that's what the EU is doing. So I'm not too sure about the. It just goes to show that uh, this is the system they want. Endless debt. 
And uh, maybe it's a blessing in disguise for the Eurozone that they, uh, they don't have a central fiscal authority or treasury. Uh, maybe uh, the Euro uh, <laughs> might not be such a bad currency to hold. Uh, of course, it's still a fiat currency. But uh, anyway, that's what I wanted to touch upon. And now to the Tower of Basel. I highly recommend this book, Adam Libor. Uh, you can find it online. Search for it. Uh, I've uh, stopped putting links for Amazon and being an associate there. It's not really a good uh, deal for me. Um, I think you guys should just look for it. Um, so, yeah, the BIS. You know, nowadays, what what is said about the BIS? It says... Bank for International Settlements is an international financial institution owned by, owned by central banks, fosters international monetary and financial cooperation, and serves as a bank for central banks. The BIS carries out its work through its meetings, programs, and through Basel process, hosting international groups, global financial stability, and facilitating their interaction. Well, they also host the Financial Stability Board, FSB, uh, and the way they talk about the FSB is this completely, uh, you know, separate entity from the BIS, but it's not. It's based in Basel uh, and it's hosted by the BIS, the FSB. So there you go. Uh, and the other thing about the BIS, it's like a foreign government when you are uh, working on behalf or you going there on the BIS's business you know, Jay Powell carries a diplomatic passport. Mario Draghi carries one. And they go there every uh, two months uh, to meet. So, Hitler's American banker. That's on chapter six. So, who is this guy? It's Thomas McKit McKittrick. So, here's in chapter six. Hitler's international banker, right? So, it, it just goes on to say here how Thomas McKittrick, McKittrick uh, was the president of the BIS during um, World War II. Uh, the Fed didn't have a, a representative there, but uh, it might as well have been Thomas McKittrick. Uh, it says here, uh, was an, McKittrick uh, was an American banker, president of the BIS during World War II, whose close relationship with Hitler's Third Reich has stirred controversy. Uh, was he put in jail after World War II? No, it says from 1946, McKittrick worked for the Chase National Bank, that's the Rockefeller Bank, becoming a senior vice president and director. He headed a survey mission for the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development to India in the 1950s. He died in January uh, 21st, 1970. <coughs> Excuse me, in... Uh, Newton, Newton, New Jersey. Uh, McKittrick was a family friend of Alan Dulles, a U.S. intelligence officer, uh, also based in Switzerland during World War II. Dulles uh, later became director of the CIA. So you see all these guys are, uh, it's amazing. So here are the interesting sections uh, about how, you know, this bank dealt with, uh, with the enemy. Uh, during World War II. Uh, it says uh, on page 78, and I read, McKittrick gave an understanding to the Swiss authorities that all staff would not undertake political activities of any sort whatsoever on behalf of any governments and national organizations. Any su such departures, he noted in the memo to staff, would be particularly regrettable uh, at present when special privileges are being sought on behalf of the bank itself. A safe passage home would be arranged for anyone who wanted to leave. So this is talking about how they promised the Swiss authorities that they would be totally neutral during World War II because uh, the German bankers were there. You know, they had all kind. you know, even the Japanese bankers were at the BIS. It goes on to say, the BIS declaration of neutrality meant, meant the following. The bank would not grant credit to the central banks of belliger belligerent countries. It would, when operating on 
neutral markets ensured that belligerents did not profit from such operations. They would not carry out any transactions, either direct or indirect, between countries at war with each other. So they gave all these... Uh, uh, promises, but then it goes on to say the banks and declarations of neutrality soon proved worthless. McKittrick and the rest of the bank's management turned the BIS into a de facto arm of the Reichsbank. That's the German uh, national bank or central bank. This was not a result of inertia, inertia, passivity, or bureaucratic sloth. It followed from a series of deliberate policy decisions. The BIS ca carried out foreign exchange deals with the Reichsbank. It accepted looted Nazi gold until the final days of the war when even neutral countries such as Sweden had begun to refuse it. It recognized the forcible incorporation of occupied countries, including France, Belgium, Greece, and the Netherlands, into the, right, the Third Reich. By doing so, it also legitimized the role of Nazi-controlled national banks in the occupied countries in appropriating Jewish-owned assets. The BIS allowed the Nazi occupation regimes to take ownership of BIS shares so that the Axis bloc held 67.4% of the bank's voting stock. Board meetings were suspended, but annual general meetings continued. Shareholder banks voted by proxy. And then it says here on page 125, uh, this is, I think, uh, towards the end of the war, or after, just after the war, it says, In Basel, McKittrick was enraged by the attacks on the bank. He wrote to the Bank of England and demanded a full investigation, in, full investigation into the BIS's wartime record, which he apparently believed would exoner exonerate him. The prospects of that set off alarms from Whitehall, the British government quarter to Threadneedle Street, where Lord Cato, the new governor of the Bank of England, had, who had taken over from Norm, Montague Norman. Mank, McKittrick noted a, a Foreign Office memo had gone native in neutral Switzerland and was thoroughly out of touch with the way people were thinking nowadays. Um, the end of the war did not seem to bring McKittrick any closer to reality. In March 1945, Orvis Schmidt, U.S. Treasury official who had attended the Bretton Woods Conference, met McKittrick in Switzerland. Schmidt, like his boss Harry Morgenthau, was not a, not a fan of either McKittrick or the BIS, and McKittrick knew it. So uh, there you go. I mean, um, you would think this guy would be uh, in jail or be tried at Nuremberg, even though he was an American. Uh, but uh, apparently, also, it, it talks about at the end of, uh, at Bretton Woods, uh, Norway, I think, they wanted to have this bank uh, liquidated. I mean, that would have been great. But uh, guess who uh, blocked um, this uh, motion? Well, it was the British delegation uh, who, that was headed by uh, none other than John Maynard Keynes, that great uh, <laughs> Keynes, right? So there you have it. Uh, that's why, you know, all wars, at least all the wars in the last few hundred years are bankers' war, wars, and they benefit from both sides. They don't care who wins because uh, they finance both sides, and the BIS is proof of that. Uh, we need to expose the BIS. It's still around, and it's still, uh, you know, above the law. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you share it far and wide with people who you think might enjoy this kind of content, wake people up about uh, how we're still being run by these uh, central bankers, the BIS, uh, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England. Um, yeah, and uh, make sure you also hit the like button if you enjoyed the video. Uh, don't forget to hit the little notification bell above to be notified of all my new videos. You can also follow me on Twitter, Steemit, and on DTube. I wish you all a great day. Take care. Bye.